In this video, I'm going to describe and formally define context-free grammars and context-free languages. Let's begin by looking at an example context-free grammar. Here we see several productions, sometimes we call them rules, and we see some non-terminals and some terminal symbols. Uh, in this example, our non-terminal symbols are E, T, and F. You can tell they're non-terminals because they appear on the left-hand side of rules. On the right-hand side of rules, we have both non-terminals, like E and T, and terminals, like the plus, the multiplication, and the parentheses, and a terminal symbol called A here. We're using a shorthand for writing multiple rules on one line, and this is very common. The vertical bar here shows two different right-hand sides, and it's nothing more than shorthand for two separate productions. So what does a context-free grammar have? Every context-free grammar has variables, terminals, rules, and a start variable. One of the variables is distinguished as the start variable. Uh, generally, it's uh, S, and uh, we assume that the first non-terminal on the first rule, the left-hand side of the first rule, by default, is the start symbol. So in our previous example, E is assumed to be the start symbol, or the start variable. Variables are sometimes called uh, non-terminals, and I try to use the term non-terminals as much as I can. Terminals are uh, symbols from the alphabet, so we're describing languages here, and the fundamental symbols which we string together are symbols from the alphabet. In some examples, they're individual letters, like paren and a, and in other context-free grammars that are a little bit more complex. In a programming language grammar, we use the term tokens for the terminals. So the context-free grammar creates a string of tokens or describes legal strings of tokens, and the tokens themselves are more complex, generally described by regular expression, and can consist of sequences of, of characters such as identifiers and so on. The context-free grammar has a number of rules and these are sometimes called productions. Uh, occasionally you'll see this notation instead of the arrow E goes to E plus E colon colon equal is a more traditional symbol for a context-free grammar rule and if you see that symbol you know you're dealing with a context-free grammar if you see just an arrow, well, it could be all kinds of things, but in our examples it'll indicate rules or productions in the grammar. Next, let's talk about how we can use a context-free grammar to generate a string of symbols. Here's our grammar, our sample grammar again, and here is a derivation. So with a derivation you start with the starting symbol, in this case it's E, and at each step you apply one of the rules to change the form, making it longer and longer, until ultimately you're left with a string of only terminals. So we can see that we began by replacing E with E plus T using the first rule. E goes to E plus T. Then we replaced T, sorry, then we replaced E again, but this time we use the second rule with T. E is replaced by T. And in the third step, we replace T with an F, and we keep going, replacing and replacing, until ultimately we end up with a string of terminals. So this tells you that this string of symbols is in the language that's described by this context-free grammar. We could stop part way through, for example, at this step, and we find we've got a string with some terminals like A plus paren, and some non-terminals like T and F. So this is what's called a sentential form. And in our derivation on the way from the start symbol to the final string of terminals, we have a number of different sentential forms. Now this, these derivations can be lengthy, and so oftentimes we use uh, this notation with a star to say that it goes from one sentential form to another sentential form in zero or more steps. Okay, so this line right here describes our entire derivation all the way from E to the string. 
Here's another example of this notation where we're going from E, we do a few steps, and we get this sentential form, which is right here in our derivation. And then we do one more step in the derivation from here to here by expanding the E using the rule that E goes to T. And then we do zero or more, and we finally end up with a sentential form that contains only terminal symbols. In our derivation up here, notice that whenever we chose to expand one of the non-terminals using one of the rules, we always chose the leftmost non-terminal. At this step, in the first step there was only one non-terminal. In the second step we could have expanded E or T, but we chose the leftmost one. We expanded E. And again, we chose T to expand, this T and not that T. And then we chose F to expand, and so on, always choosing at every step the non-terminal in the sentential form that is to the left. That's a particular kind of derivation that we call a leftmost derivation. We always choose the leftmost variable in the sentential form to expand. And we can also define rightmost derivation the same way. We always choose the rightmost variable. So here's a sentential form. F goes to F plus T. We expand the F to A. Here we chose, in the rightmost derivation, to expand T instead to an F. But notice that regardless of which one you do first, you end up with the same thing in the end. Okay, you always end up with the same string in the end. So there's a correspondence between a leftmost derivation and a rightmost derivation. derivation. Here's our grammar again, and here's a sample string that we're able to produce with this grammar. For every leftmost derivation of this string, there's exactly one rightmost derivation. And for every rightmost derivation, there's exactly one leftmost derivation. Now, it may be that there are several different leftmost derivations to derive this string. There might be f 17 different ways to derive a particular string with leftmost derivations. And that means there are 17 different ways to derive it with a rightmost derivation. So whether we do a, a rightmost derivation or a leftmost derivation um, is not really that important. We could also expand our non-terminals in no particular order, and then we have something that's a derivation, a legal derivation, but that's not a rightmost and not a leftmost derivation. So for that reason, the parse tree is particularly useful because a parse tree abstracts away the order in which we chose our non-terminals to expand. Here is a parse tree sometimes called a derivation tree, for the same string. Reading off the leaves, we see a plus paren a times a paren. So we read the leaves in exactly the same, in order, and uh, uh, we see that the terminal string is uh, exactly the string that we're deriving right here. And we also see which rules are applied. Our first rule, our first step in the derivation took e to e plus t. And we can see the sentential form here. And then we expanded this e with the rule e goes to t. And we expanded this t with the rule t goes to f. Which order we do them in is abstracted away in the parse tree. We only see which rules were used and where they were used, not when they were used. Here's our grammar again, and I just want to reiterate that we get the same result regardless of what order we apply the rules in. What matters is which rule we choose to use and where we use it, not when we use it. In this derivation of f plus t, we're going to uh, a plus a, and we're choosing to expand the f first using the rule uh, f goes to A, and then we're choosing to expand the T using the rule T goes to F, and then F goes to A. Down here we're doing the T first. Instead of this F, we're doing this T first, and we're expanding to F, um, and then to A, and then finally we're doing that first F, expanding it. Doesn't matter which order you do these derivations, all that matters is which rules you're using and where you're using them. 
So that's the benefit of the parse tree because you lose the information about when but not where or what. Here's a parse tree for this particular derivation. If we take a slice through the parse tree, we get a sentential form. If we take a slice here, we get f plus t, and that's the sentential form that we're starting with, f plus t. And as we sort of derive down, we move this slice down until we've got nothing but terminal symbols. So the parse tree abstracts away the actual order in which the rules are used. It only remembers which rules were used. Now let's give the formal definition of a context-free grammar. It is a four-tuple consisting of variables, the alphabet, the rules, and the start variable. So to be more specific, a grammar, a context-free grammar, is a four-tuple consisting of the set of variables, which I prefer to call the set of non-terminals. Sigma is the set of terminals, okay, the, the symbols from the alphabet. Okay? And in particular, notice that V and sigma should be disjoint. In other words, their intersection should be empty. There should be no symbols that are both variables and terminals. Okay? If you look at a symbol, it ought to be clear whether it's a variable or terminal. And typically, uh, we don't go to the trouble of spelling out what these two sets are. We just look at the rules. If some symbol appears on the left-hand side of a rule, then by definition, it is a non-terminal symbol. And every other symbol that appears in the rules, by default, is a terminal symbol. Both sets are finite sets, and generally fairly small. Then we have a set of productions, a set of rules. And finally, we have to identify which of these rules, uh, which of these non-terminals is the starting non-terminal. And when we write our rules down on paper, the uh, procedure is to write uh, the, the starting symbol uh, down first and define it first. Now we get to two very important definitions. The language of a grammar is the set of strings made up of terminal symbols such that starting with the start symbol we can derive that string. Okay, to say this another way, any string that we can derive with a grammar is in the language of that grammar. A grammar defines a language. Remember that a language is a set of strings. The strings themselves have to be finite in length. Languages, in general, are infinite sets of strings. So that means, in a language, generally we'll have some short strings and some very long strings and some arbitrarily large strings. Since it's an infinite set, the only way we can have an infinite set of strings is by allowing longer and longer and longer strings. So, if you give me a length, then if the, set, if the language is infinite, then if you give me a length, there will be a string of that, length, of that length or greater in the language. So a language is just a set of strings, and the language of a particular context-free grammar is a set of strings that can be derived from the start symbol. A context-free language is a language, by definition, that's generated by a context-free grammar. So that is the defini definition of what a context-free language is. If there is a context-free grammar to describe that language, then it is a context-free language. We may not know what the grammar is, but the language itself can still be context-free. It may be difficult to find the grammar for the language, but the language is context-free if and only if there exists at least one context-free grammar to describe it. And I should note that given a particular context-free language, there can be many, many context-free grammars that describe it. You can always add unnecessary rules that aren't ever used or uh, applicable and get a slightly different grammar. So there are uh, an infinite number of context-free grammars for every context-free language. We would like to have a small, 
easy to understand grammar, but those are particularly difficult to uh, discover. The bottom line is that if there is a context-free grammar to describe the language, then the language is context-free. Otherwise, it is not. Now let's look at an example context-free grammar. Here is our grammar. It consists of three rules. One, two, three. S goes to prin, s prin, s goes to ss, and s goes to epsilon. In this example, we see that the right-hand sides uh, consist of a string of terminals and non-terminals, and that string of symbols can be empty. So occasionally in grammars, you'll see an epsilon on the right-hand side of a rule. And we can see, by definition, uh, there's only one uh, uh, non-terminal in this grammar, so it must be the start symbol, uh, and it is S. What does this thing generate? Well, it generates the empty string, clearly. And then you could use the first rule and then let S go to epsilon, and that would give you prin prin. And uh, if you kind of analyze this thing, uh, you can see that for every time you generate a left print, you'll generate a right print somewhere to the right of it. And this rule says you can sort of generate lots of different combinations. And this is the language that's generated by it, uh, or at least I'm sketching out the language. The language is the set of parentheses where you have the parentheses being balanced in the traditional uh, way that we balance them in, in uh, arithmetic expressions. A lot of times in complicated expressions like this, in, when I'm programming or whatever, and I get confused, if I've got it on paper I can draw a line from one pr the opening parenthesis to the matching closed parenthesis. Here's another example context-free grammar. The rules that uh, describe this language are s goes to epsilon and s goes to 0, s, 1. If you think about it, for every 0 you generate on the left-hand side, you generate a 1 on the right-hand side. Here's a sample parse tree for a string. And you see that s goes to 0, s, 1. And this s goes to 0, s, 1 and so on. So you get a string of zeros followed by a string of ones such that the number of zeros is exactly the same as the number of ones. At the bottom, and I didn't draw this very well, uh, in fact s goes to 0 s 1 and then the final s goes to epsilon. Also in this uh, drawing of the parse tree I have uh, pulled all the leaves down a bit so that you can see what the string of terminal symbols is more easily. Here is the language expressed in different notation. 0 to the n, 1 to the n. Now, elsewhere I use the pumping lemma to show that this language is not a regular language. So we've given a context-free grammar for this language and therefore, this language is a context-free language. So we've shown that the regular languages are a subset, and it's a proper subset of the context-free languages. Every regular language is a context-free language, but there are many, many context-free languages which are not regular.